Hi, my name is Gerhard Schwann, and welcome to the Sales Up Shop. I'm Anthony and Arena. Let's listen to a clip from uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Well, we made this observation early on that most companies mess up by moving too slowly and trying to be too precise. The biggest risk is not taking any risk, right? Because the world is changing so quickly, right? And sure, any given risk that you might take, you might mess up and um, and you, you, it might end up being really bad, but in a world that's changing really quickly, the only strategy where you're guaranteed to fail is not taking any risk and not changing anything. What is your advice to sales leaders uh, for taking reasonable risks so they avoid being stale and they lead people to the cutting edge, not to the bleeding edge? Okay, so he, he caught lightning in a bottle. You know, and it's easy to talk about taking risks when you're in that sort of business and you're in this particular period of time. But I promise you as a public company, the appetite for risk will decline tremendously every quarter. And particularly after any quarter where they miss their number, the appetite for risk will continue to plummet uh, because that's the reality of business. And here's, here's, I think, the struggle for us as sales leaders and as business leaders. You don't want to upset what's got you this far. So you tend to stick with the status quo because you think it's work. This is what's going to work for us. We have to stick to our knitting and do this. But you have to find a way to break out. And I think you're the, you use the term reasonable risk. You have to be able to make some bets that are off to the side that you're willing to lose because you can't stay in the same game that you've been in for the last couple decades. It's changing too fast. It's too disruptive. But I don't think that what we're looking for in sales or in business right now is that leap that makes us Facebook. For most of us, that isn't going to happen. But you do have to start coloring outside the lines and saying, where is the next advantage coming from? I wrote a post a couple days ago about Drucker. And Drucker said, the job of a company is to create a customer. And it boils down to two things, marketing and innovation. So this is how do we create value now? How are we going to create value in the future? And if you're not playing around the edges saying, what's the future value creation? What are we going to do to better serve this group of customers that we have? What are we going to do to attract the customers that we want that we don't have? That's where you have to start playing and say, we have to take some risks and try things. The older your company is and the longer the management structure has been in place, I think the less appetite there is to play around there. And I think that that's really where sales leaders and business leaders should be looking. What's the next level of value that we can create? Essentially, we are at an intersection where we are still learning from the past and extract the lessons from the past and apply them to our businesses. But now let's look at that uh, video clip from Mark Zuckerberg where he says the past five years have been devoted to making connections. I mean, I often talk to, to our company and outside the company about this narrative where the last five years of social networking have been about getting people connected, right? The next five years, or, or whatever it's going to be, five, ten years, are now going to be about what are all the things that you can build now that you have all these connections in place. What do you think that social media is going to lead us? Or are we going to leave social media and come up with something better? I don't think so. I think that uh, that battle's already been fought and won. We want to be connected. We want to have a voice. We want to have a relationship with uh, the companies that we buy from, especially the more strategic the purchase, the more we want in, in that sort of engagement. And I don't think that we're going to leave that. I think it's only going to deepen. And I think what we're going to see is a greater inter integration of the tool set in the future. I can't imagine how it would be otherwise. We're already connecting intranets to extranets. We're sharing more data back and forth. And I think the connections are only going to get deeper as we learn what to do. I know this year the big buzzword is big data. I'm still a small data guy. I like to know individual information that allows me to deal with people that I'm sitting across from. But we're collecting a lot of data and we are going to learn how to connect these things together to create value. There's no question about it. I think Zuckerberg's right in as much as what we've been doing so far is paving over the cow paths. You know, these, these lines were already drawn. Now we're using a new toolkit. What's that going to enable in the future? I don't think we've gotten there yet. I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what that's going to look like. I have listened to Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn. Let's uh, play a clip. Because I basically thought that what was going to happen is all of our real world networks, all of our identities and our actual real relationships are going to get translated online in a way that that now becomes a platform that new kinds of applications about how we navigate the world was going to play out. And I think this is an ongoing trend that when you think about 
how do you solve various kinds of problems? So I, for example, and I suspect the conversation will get into this, but you know, what does the modern university look like? What should governments be doing? How should corporations be doing innovation? How should individuals be managing their careers? The question of what's the network way, uh, thinking way of doing that, is I now think is a very central question to, to looking at um, kind of how do you amplify and supercharge. And I'll add one more thing before we get to the next part of this, which is, Part of when people ask me, how do you build all their Silicon Valleys? And the really key thing is creating network density because it's the network density of people being able to find each other with the right information and expertise, resources in a fast moving clock that is the thing that creates the amplifier for entrepreneurship. Before we jump into this, let's look at the three images. Uh, first, uh, think about the mental image you, ha you have in your mind about the human brain and how the neurons are all interconnected. Secondly, let's look at the universe and uh, let's look at a picture of the galaxies on how all the stars are interconnected. And then let's look at the third image of uh, how we are all connected through social media. What comes to my mind when I listen to Reid Hoffman that we need to look at our world through what he calls the networked way of thinking. So he's suggesting to use the collective network that we have established as a lens to understand problems better and then hopefully to co-create and collaborate and create something that didn't exist before. What do you think? I think that we're attaching all the brains to a network. And I think that we have a global brain and a global consciousness anyway. And now we're leveraging technology to do what we couldn't do without technology. And it's an interesting paradox to me, especially the way that, that Reid Hoffman defines that network density. Because originally when I joined LinkedIn, I had 85 connections on LinkedIn. And I, I believe Dunbar, Robin Dunbar's number, that you can have 155 relationships. Some people a little more, maybe as many as 205. And I think that that's true because I think that we're social creatures and social relationships come with a cost and it's a high cost. There's a maintenance cost to maintaining those relationships and you have a limited time and a limited capacity to manage all those relationships. That said, I had a good friend who's a LinkedIn guru who came to me and said, of all people, you should open up your LinkedIn and accept everybody, which was the most frightening idea I could think of because I know the people in my network when there's 85. And if you were to call me, Gerhard, and say, can you tell me about this person? I would be able to tell you without a doubt, yes, this is the right person for you to deal with in this particular way. Now with 2,700, I can still tell you about 150 people, give or take, uh, that I really know. But what it's allowed me to do when I need something, when I'm trying to find an answer, when I'm trying to reach a prospect, when I'm trying to reach across the network, by accepting all those people, my reach is something like 16 or 18 million people that I can now find that I would have had no access to except for the nodes along that network that allow me to get there. And I think that that's an, an important change. There's more access. And so I hear salespeople say, well, I don't need to fill out my LinkedIn profile or I don't really need a social presence. And I talk about having a social a digital surrogate, but it's, it's not only who you can find, it's who can find you. And you can't be in a world where network density counts and you've decided to be invisible. I call these people secret agents. You're working behind the scenes. You're a great value creator, but no one's allowed to know. How does that serve you? Whatever business you're in, you wanna make sure it's known. And this network density is what allows you to be found. Well, on that note, our time is up. Anthony, thank you for that great conversation. Thanks, Gerhard.